please excuse me tonight. I, I am getting over a cold. So if I have to stop for a minute to cough, I actually got my COVID results yesterday. I'm negative. So I'm happy about that. So I've been a uh, commercial photographer for 23 years. Um, and actually, I see in the list of, of people who are on tonight, uh, a, a special name, uh, Greg Dean. Uh, Mr. Dean was uh, an instructor of mine at KSS many years ago. And uh, he was actually one of the people who inspired me in photography. Um, uh, he he taught me geography, but he used to actually present uh, all of his beautiful landscape photography, uh, particularly through the uh, the American Southwest, and uh, and and his work really inspired me. I, I ended up going on to do uh, photography uh, right after high school. Um, so I yeah, I've been doing entirely commercial photography for twenty three years, uh, and I would say that. Uh, I, right from the beginning, I discovered an affinity for um, architectural photography because I think it it appealed to the perfectionist side of me. Um, and uh, and early in my career, I did a lot of boat photography. I did a lot of fashion type photography, and I realized very quickly that uh, I preferred inanimate objects. So uh, architectural is is a great fit for that. Um, I. Uh, I kind of debated back and forth how I was going to do tonight's presentation because, as I said, I've, I've been doing this a long time and, and I've, I've played with lots of different techniques over the years and uh, I wasn't sure sort of what level of experience we were going to have tonight. Uh, as Ray and Peter both said, you know, we've got a broad range of experience, so my apologies if, if some of it's exceptionally basic or if it's, if it's over uh, your head. But I think at the end of the day, regardless of where you're at in your photography career, uh, there are still concepts and ideas that you'll still be able to pull out of things uh, that, that might be helpful in your architectural photography. Um, so I started my uh, architectural photography career really at uh, Langara College. Uh, they had an architectural photography course there, which was pretty uh, rare. And, um, and I did that and learned a lot about it and, uh, and built my portfolio. Uh, my focus today is, is primarily on luxury hotels and resorts. So that's what, uh, that's what we shoot primarily. Um, unfortunately, with, with COVID, that's kind of on hold at the moment. Uh, not much of that going on. So um, I um, now when I started back at, uh, uh, it, let's see, in Langara, that would have been early 2000s. So of course, at that time, uh, everything I was shooting was on film. And so, you know, in those days, computers had absolutely nothing to do with photography. Um, in fact, I mean, I, well, I, I suppose the only thing that computers had to do with when you went to buy your film, you'd have to, you know, pay with your credit card and they'd run it through a computer. That was about the only thing that computers had to do with photography. So in some ways, you know, as my careers evolved, I've kind of felt like uh, I didn't really sign up for this. Uh, and so I've, I've learned to hire retouchers. So I work with a lot of retouchers now uh, and, uh, and they're exceptional at what they do. It allows me to focus on what I love the most and that's spending time on set and lighting and shooting and that sort of thing. And then I don't get bogged down with, with as much post-production work. I have this sort of general rule of thumb that just about for every hour of, of time that I'm on set, uh, it's about two hours in the computer. Uh, and I'd personally rather not spend that. So I'm gonna go through some retouching of some images tonight. And and uh, if it looks like I don't know what I'm doing, it's probably because I don't. Uh, I uh, What I've learned has been mostly from retouchers and from uh, self-taught. Uh, when I say self-taught, I mean YouTube. But um, yeah, so uh, when I first started in photography, like I said, it was in film. And so um, it was very much this attitude or this idea that you get it in camera, right? Um, you get one shot. Uh, so you, you might go and set up six, seven lights and, you know, you get everything dialed in and you wait for the right time of day and you click that shutter once or twice and that's your photo. Uh, whereas, and, and, and I carried that technique quite a ways into my career, I'd say until like in the 2010s kind of thing, because um, that was what I was used to and I was comfortable with that. But my strategy or my technique has really evolved over time. And just especially in the last five years, uh, I've gone from that kind of get it in camera attitude to much more uh, an idea of compositing. And so we're going to go through an actual composited image tonight. And that's essentially in a nutshell where you're taking a whole bunch of different frames at various exposures uh, and with different accent lighting and color and props in different places and all that sort of stuff. And then you're putting it all together in the end. So um, I've had uh, a couple of times in my career, uh, one image that was comprised of about 60 different photographs 
composited into one final. Uh, and um, it's certainly a lot more labor intensive uh, all around, but there are huge advantages and uh, it allows more control uh, over lighting. Uh, it allows uh, you the ability to go back later and actually change the way that the image looks. So you're not stuck with, with how a photograph sort of turns out. You can create that image more or less. Um, again, that technique relies heavily on retouching skill or uh, the use of retouchers. Um, so just sort of some general theory about um, architectural photography, of course, you know, it's the capturing of places and spaces. So I generally break it down to interior architectural and exterior architectural. Uh, both come with different ideas, different techniques, that sort of thing. At the end of the day, all of the same sort of general rules of photography that you know about, you know, the leading lines and rule of thirds, all those compositional elements, they all apply, of course. Um, so when I walk into, let's, let's say an interior, so I walk into a space, what I try to do is to kind of guide the viewer through that space and give them a real sense of what it would be like if they were to go there. Um, I don't shoot a lot of real estate, but I do shoot for a lot of architects, developers, designers, that kind of thing. And so, um, you know, the, the audience that they're showing their photography to is generally a, an audience that um, will never get to ultimately see that space. Um, whereas real estate, you know, you want to entice somebody to come in and check out that listing, uh, that sort of thing. This is um, a, a little bit more time spent on a single photograph, make it as good as you can, and it becomes a portfolio piece for that architect, that developer, that designer, whomever else. Uh, and so I go into that space um, and I try to look at it with fresh eyes if I haven't seen it before. And what is the story that I want to tell in that space? Um, how do I want to place the camera that shows off what that space is about? With real estate photography, I find so much of it is about just like throw on the, the 14 mil lens and show the whole space and that just that's what it is. But I find with architectural photography, it's a little bit more nuanced where um, you want to create a sense of feeling, uh, maybe if you can, a bit of emotion, all, all those sorts of things. Uh, surrounding the space. Um, it sounds a little airy-fairy, but once we get into it, I think I'll be able to explain it a little bit better. Um, so composition is a big one. Certainly lens choice is a big one. Uh, balance, I, I always talk about balance and I think very much in terms of balance when I look at a photograph uh, where, you know, you have some, some parts of a frame can be very heavy and it, you know, it, it's pulling you down on this side and some, you know, can be very light. So finding that balance uh, in a frame is really important. Um, and uh, so Arnold Newman, he, uh, he had one of my favorite quotes. Uh, he's once said that uh, uh, architectural photography is 1% talent and 99% moving furniture. And that very much goes to the balance part of it, whereby, um, you know, I'll go set up a camera in a room and it's very, very rare that I'll be able to just sort of leave things the way they are. It, you almost always are setting up the camera and you're moving that coach or you're moving that, you know, that ottoman or love seat or whatever else to create the look of the space. Um, you know how it is with optics and all that stuff. It doesn't represent exactly how the eye sees it. So you've got to create that. Um, Along that same vein, as you know, cameras don't see the world are in the way our eyes do, and that in, in a big way comes down to dynamic range. Uh, we see bright whites and dark blacks. Um, the camera doesn't see that kind of range, and that's where compositing uh, and or supplemental light really comes in handy. And again, we'll get more into that. I've got some example photos that I'm gonna run through and I can talk about specifics with, with some of those photos. But um, generally speaking, uh, dynamic ranges is a big challenge for cameras. They still don't see the way a human does. And so you're, you're creating that tonal range. I love, um, is a favorite cinematographer of mine, it's, his name is escaping me right now, but he, he, uh, Conrad Hall uh, Sr. He, um, he passed away a number of years ago, but he, he often said with photography, he always tries to have a black in a photograph and a white in a photograph. And that's sort of a, a it kind of resets the eye so that you have a you have a complete tonal range and I try to do that with photography if I can have a black and a white so that the eye is seeing everything in between um, so that's uh, 
uh, composition balance, I'll go into um, camera height. Um, Generally, you know, everybody can kind of picture if you look up at a building, you, your lines will kind of converge up this way. If you're looking down, it, it, you know, you get your camera up high, you're looking down into a room, the lines will converge this way. So generally speaking, I try to get a camera more or less roughly in the middle of the room. Uh, and that helps to get the lines straight. We'll talk more about lines later, but um, uh, especially for architects and, and designers, they really want to see straight lines in architectural photography. Your job is to represent, um, visually represent the building or the room as it is. You know, that architect, let's say, has put a lot of time and effort and, and attention into getting everything perfect. And it's your job to uh, convey that. Um, if you've got, you know, weird converging lines that aren't straight, of course, it, it sort of reflects poorly on an architect. They don't like that, generally speaking. Um, so, um, you know, we'll get into this too, but you know, you look up at a building, this has to do with perspective, you expect those converging lines. So if suddenly you take those converging lines and you stretch them out so that they're straight, that doesn't really work either. And I'll, I'll show an example of that. But um, yeah, so, so um, camera height is really important. It, it, it also is, um, what I try to do is I, I, I kind of cheat camera height a little bit, typically a little bit lower than, than a normal human height. Uh, if anybody here has met me, you'll know that that's going to be a really low camera. Uh, so I, I'm usually bringing the camera down to about kind of five feet, generally speaking, a little bit lower. It helps to sort of cheat that ceiling height a little bit. Uh, you feel like it's a bigger space. It doesn't have that claustrophobic closed in feeling. I find bringing that camera as low as you can to the point that it still looks like a human perspective really can help help an image, especially with real estate. You're trying to sell a property, you want those ceilings to look nice and tall. Um, so um, another thing, uh, of course, is, is uh, leading the eye. So you, you, again, back to that storytelling, you want to, you want to hold that viewer's attention to a photograph for as long as you can. And, and taking the eye through a bit of a story through the image and looking at all the details, and then ultimately ending up in a certain point. And Typically, that point that a viewer will end up in is the brightest part of the photograph. So I will often, if I'm shooting a, a room or whatever, I will try to place the brightest point of the image in the furthest distance. Uh, and that will sort of help to guide the image through, through the, the viewer through the image. Um, one other thing that, uh, that really helps uh, sometimes, depending upon the image, and actually it's with my example tonight, is to include people in architectural photography. Uh, people use architecture, so it's, it's very fitting that, uh, that a person be in an architectural photograph. Often you'll see a lot of architectural photographers will um, uh, uh, use it like a motion blur. So you can either do that in camera or, or in post, of course. I try to do that in camera where you literally will have a model standing in the frame on a slow shutter, let's say a half a second, and I will get them to rock back and forth on two feet, just like this back and forth, and I'll trip that shutter and then it will create a blurry motion in the photo. It just adds a little bit of, you know, a, a dynamic element to the image, a little bit of movement. And a nice thing about including a, a human in your photograph is it naturally provides a sense of scale. So scale is big in architectural photography. We all, we all kind of intuitively know the size of a water bottle or the size of a human. And so placing those into your photographs can really um, help uh, to, to, to set the scale. Um, Another important consideration, so let's say a client contracts me, uh, we want you to do this job. Uh, one of the first things I'll do is I'll hop on Google Earth. Uh, let's, say it's, uh, let's say it's an exterior architectural photo. I want to know what's around the building, uh, where the sun is in relation to the building, uh, and I'll kind of plan the shoot out that way. I'll get more into sun position later on, but um, uh, Sun position is a huge part of, of architectural photography. You can't always control the lighting. Uh, and so um, knowing what, where your sun is, what it's going to do, and at what time, that's really important. I use an uh, app on my phone called SunPath. And I, uh, it's literally, you, you bring it up, and you can point it at the sky, and you sort of track it around and use the accelerometer and gyro inside the phone. And it knows where you're pointing, and it will show you 
the position of the sun on a certain day at a certain time in the sky. So, uh, you know, if I go to a location, I'll use sun path and I'll find out exactly, okay, that the sun's going to hit right there. It's going to create this shadow right here. That's the time I want to be in this spot. Uh, and that's typically how I'll plan my shooting schedule. Um, with my client and with my lighting assistants. So we'll have everything kind of pre-dialed and we know at three o'clock we have to be here, at four o'clock we have to be here. Um, and then for interiors, we hope for overcast. <laughs> and then we don't have to deal with any of it. Um, yeah, but uh, exteriors, you know, you typically want the sun, especially architecturally in the Okanagan, everybody wants that bluebird, beautiful sunny day. Um, gear, I'll, I'll talk quickly about gear. Um, I use the Canon 5DSR. Uh, I uh, have a sturdy tripod, super important for architectural photography. Um, wide lenses come in very, very handy. Um, on that note, actually, I'll just mention, when you're trying to tell the story of, of a project, let's say, a, let's say an interior designer hires you to capture a home, um, those wide shots are just as important as the little details. So you might go in and you get a, you, you, you capture just an element of a throw over the edge of a couch or uh, just thinking about a hotel client who hired us uh, back in February. They, um, they had a 200 year old heritage hotel and you know, we were hired to capture room shots, but one photograph that they wanted was a detail shot of a little piece of stone on the outside of this heritage hotel, uh, carved stone. And, just that little element they included in their website uh, as, as sort of this, this story or the, this um, idea that, you know, we're old, we, we, we have some heritage uh, and some history, all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's all the detail shots too that help to kind of complete that story. It's not just these big wide shots of a, of a space. So um, I'll get into some, I'll, I'll try a screen share here. And I'll run through some photos. Each one kind of has different stories associated with it. And um, actually, I have the, I know we're supposed to do a Q&A, but if we, I have the chat up here. If anybody thinks of anything that they don't want to wait until the Q&A later, by all means, I, I can see your chat. So, so throw it in there. But OK, let's try a screen share here. Um, this was actually, interestingly enough, uh, uh, an, a photograph for an invitation to a charity event. Uh, they wanted to create this sense of this uh, mansion uh, where you have these uh, this sort of cool blue light surrounding uh, the viewer and then this warm light inside, sort of this kind of like welcoming in uh, kind of idea. Uh, and so we, uh, we lit this up quite heavily. Um, you'll see, actually you can kind of see reflections here and here of two uh, large soft boxes that we had just off to the left side of frame, the right side of frame. That provided the fill light to kind of fill in the scene a little bit. Uh, and then we waited for the right time of day where we get this blue dusky kind of light hitting the outside of the home. And then inside uh, we placed a light uh, and uh, with no diffusion on it. And that just created this hard light coming through, just sort of this creative way of, of saying, you know, welcoming you in. Interestingly, we, uh, the initial idea here was to have a smoke machine with some smoke kind of pouring out and add a little bit of mystery, but it looked that, like the house was on fire. So we, uh, we, we canceled that. Uh, it didn't look very good at all. Um, so a few of these I'm actually gonna include as examples of shots that I, you know, I may have liked 10 years ago or five years ago, but I'm not that keen on anymore. Um, so th this was a shot that I think Sparkling Hill is actually still using. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, I like the image, but I've subsequently had the opportunity to go back and redo this in a way that I, I like. Um, so you'll kind of, there's, you can kind of get the sense that there's a light that we've placed up here. It's uh, just illuminated this area right here, just gives it a little bit of interest, separates it so it's not, not all this kind of monotone, uh, you know, you want to pick out the geometry here and, and light it up a bit so that there's some definition. We've shot this at blue hour. So, um, you know, again, talking about like t choosing time of day, as I'm sure you know, blue hour doesn't usually last an hour. It's, it, it, you know, in the, especially in the summer, you might get 20 minutes of it if you're lucky. Um, <clears throat> and it's essentially, <clears throat> excuse me, I kind of define it as that time where the exterior amb ambient light matches the exposure of your interior lighting. So you generally get a balance between the outside and the inside. And it provides this narrow window of opportunity where you can 
in most cases get by without any supplemental lighting. You can create a beautiful image. Um, and I'm, I'm a big fan of the blue hour. I encourage it to a lot of uh, my, my clients. I, I think it's become kind of a part of my personal style and my personal brand. Um, now, one thing that I'm not a fan of with this image that uh, uh, I would do differently is um, back in these days, this is maybe seven years ago or so, it was quite popular to uh, uh, do a wet down. And so you take a garden hose and we wet down the entire concrete. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's interesting. It, you know, you get these little specular highlights and reflections and all this sort of stuff. And it, it does, it adds a little bit more contrast, a little more saturation, a little more interest to an image. However, um, you'll see that it gets patchy. You, unless you've got a whole bunch of hoses going at the same time, you really can't move fast enough that, that you can do this without it drying up and looking patchy. And, and then you get puddles and it, it just never looks that clean and good luck retouching this. Um, that would be a nightmare. So it's not really a technique I use anymore. Um, so this was kind of the example I was talking about uh, with perspective. Um, <clears throat> This is uh, obviously the Trump Tower, uh, Arthur, beautiful Arthur Erickson designed uh, tower. Um, the building is phenomenal, uh, incredible architecture. And as you can kind of tell by the twist in the, in the design, n no room is, uh, is, is the same. Uh, no room has the same design, it has the same uh, view. It's, everything is different. So that's really a unique part of it. Um, so talking about perspective, um, you can tell that the camera is at, you know, let's say human height looking up. Um, if you were to take this image and try to make lines straight, which is what you typically want to do in, in architectural photography. Actually, I'll, I'll pull up Photoshop here and just, I'll do it as an example. Um, let's bring it in here. So if I were to take this and uh, let's go to perspective and... Um, and we skew it so that our lines are straight up and down. Sure, our lines are straight up and down, and that's kind of a general rule of architectural photography is you want the straight lines. But as you can tell, I mean, that obviously doesn't look very good. Um, so you have to kind of take those rules of architectural photography and, and include in there uh, perspective. So with something like this, if you wanted those lines straight up and down, and this is a, let's say, 60-story building, you would want the camera at more or less roughly 30 stories up so that your perspective from middle to bottom and middle to top is more or less equal. That's how you're gonna get those straight lines. But this is not the shot that uh, I wanted to capture for this. I wanted to show the height and show that tower you know, climbing away from camera and it emphasizes the size and all that sort of stuff. So um, if you ask most architectural photographers, this would be a, let's, let's call it a rule breaking photograph. Um, but uh, I think it, to me, it emphasizes that there should be really no rules. It's all about the perspective of, of the viewer. Um, interesting little side note, uh, they were actually still under construction uh, when this uh, went on. And um, I'll just sort of show you here, this, this whole section right here was actually, um, right? That little piece right there was completely unfinished. And so this was actually a 3D render. Uh, we shot it as is, and then a 3D render went in and they, um, they created this piece for us and then we inserted it. Um, yeah. And then uh, a nice little, just a little extra element. You can see all of these um, uh, car headlights going by. That was real. That was all in the photo. Uh, just, uh, you know, long exposure, that sort of thing. I'll get out of that. Um, so again, speaking about perspective, uh, this was a, a drone photo of a, of a residential property, uh, again, shot at that kind of blue hour. Um, here's an example where we're shooting for the builder. Uh, and so we didn't want those lines to be skewed. We wanted straight lines, straight vertical lines. Uh, and so uh, we got the drone to pretty much, you can tell, like the, <clears throat> the drone is about halfway up this house. It's pretty much, you know, right in this area in line so that uh, these lines are straight up and down and you can tell that there hasn't been a weird perspective shift. Um, yeah, again, you know, blue hour, I, uh, my definition, that moment at which the exterior lighting uh, matches the interior. So we're able to see inside the house. There was no compositing in this image. This, it was a drone, so it's a flying camera. <clears throat> Camera's not locked off. You can't be messing around with it later, not easily anyway. And so um, what we're seeing here is, is, is real and in one photograph, and it's when those exposures match each other. 
Um, so uh, this is an example <clears throat> to talk about time of day. Uh, so this is the University of Calgary, and uh, we lucked out with a clear sky day. Uh, and the camera is facing east. Uh, you can kind of tell in the reflections, the sun has just set. Uh, this is in the twilight, you know. And so if, if you look up at the night sky at, sun, at sunset, once the sun is below the horizon, you, you'll see, you know, in the west-facing sky, you've got this bright, uh, typically warm, yellow-orange sky. But then if you look to the east, you're going to find that it's, it's this dark blue. And so essentially what you've got is you've got the light coming from behind the camera, illuminating the subject, and the background light is quite uh, relatively dark to the subject. And so um, you're able to get an image that kind of has this look. I don't really know how to describe it other than on a clear day, you get this beautiful, uh, nice gradient of sky that comes up. You've got this warm light uh, sort of evenly spilling over the building, nice reflections in the glass. So um, yeah, if you want this kind of look, uh, this is very, very shortly after the sun has gone below the horizon, looking in the opposite direction. Uh, trying to do this um, at the, let's say this is facing west, um, all of the sky would be blown out and your building would be relatively dark to the background. So um, being very conscious of where uh, your, your sun is in relation to the building, especially, uh, or not necessarily especially, but particularly uh, after the sun has gone down uh, in those brief moments after the sun has gone down. Um, okay, so we've got a five minute Q&A if anybody has any questions, uh, by all means, and, and, and a break if you need some water. Good timing on that question, because um, the only reason I threw this in was just to, uh, honestly, to plug Barcelona. Um, it, uh, it is one of the most incredible cities I've ever seen for architecture. Uh, I went there to shoot a hotel, and I tacked on an extra week uh, just so that I could explore Barcelona. And uh, if you haven't been there, I highly encourage it, especially if you're interested in, in architecture photography. Of course, now is not the time, but when that time comes, um, Barcelona it, uh, has an incredible collection of architecture, their society, their culture, their city appreciates architecture, and they they have some in incredible buildings. This is just one, one example of many a, a, pretty quick snapshot taken at dusk of um, the uh, contemporary, uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art. And it, of course, in the background, you've got the Agbar Tower, uh, just full of all kinds of interesting things from all kinds of weird and crazy and interesting architects. Uh, of course, Gaudi, if you're a fan of that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> speaking of which, uh, so this is the uh, the ceiling of La Sagrada Familia, and this was a, an incredible uh, Roman Catholic basilica right in the heart of, of of, uh, of, of Barcelona. And uh, I, I captured lots of, of photographs of this basilica, but um, just looking up at the ceiling uh, was actually one of the most interesting and, and incredible perspectives I found of, of that structure. Of course, another challenge with this is that it's just overrun by tourists. There's tons and tons of tourists in this building. And so how do you kind of capture an image? You can't take a tripod in with you. So you can't, you know, lock that camera off and shoot a whole bunch of exposures and then Photoshop people out. So how do you capture an image of this space uh, that sort of captures an essence of, of the type of architecture without getting people in your photo? And really, this was one of the only examples of, of that that I could come up with. And um, I think it, I think that it really shows off, you know, Gaudian architecture. Uh, and, and the style that you get out of it. Yeah, I, I find it very interesting. It's, it's, it's uh, super organic to me. Um, okay, so back to a, a commercial job, uh, a client in Toronto, uh, they wanted a, a balcony shot. Uh, I guess balconies and hotels, fairly rare uh, in Toronto. So th they wanna emphasize that and then show off, you know, we've got a view of the CN Tower. However, you know, you get up there and you realize, well, the balcony's two feet wide. It's, it, it's great. You've got a balcony, but it's not terribly impressive. How can we make this a little more interesting? Let's throw a person in there. So you incorporate a human. Again, it adds that sense of scale, um, adds a little bit of interest. Um, you get her leaning out and looking wistfully off in the distance, adds some, you know, storytelling in there. Um, so this was the uh, original photograph, the raw. You can see uh, my lighting assistant standing here and she's holding a light about, uh, it extends out here about six or seven feet and it's blasting this uh, little rim of light along her. Otherwise, you know, she'd just be a silhouette. Uh, you can see uh, this building in behind doesn't look very good. 
client wants it replaced. So it gets, it gets uh, replaced right there. Um, and then this, this becomes sort of your, your final shot. Um, I kind of like it, you know, a little bit tighter, that sort of thing. But uh, anyway, that's, that's how we overcame some challenges with that guy. Uh, here's an example of uh, the compositing. So we shoot this frame, uh, we shoot a frame without my lighting assistant, the model's out of there, it doesn't matter if she's there or not, and then all of these pieces right here are replaced uh, with a frame where she doesn't exist. So that, that's compositing in a nutshell, and we'll get into that. This is actually the image that I'm gonna just sort of demo a composite of uh, tonight. <clears throat> um, so this is uh, uh, same hotel in Toronto, um, and the um, the hotelier wanted a shot that really shows off their lobby. So this is the front lobby uh, entrances right here, and they wanted to highlight this art uh, that was hanging in the lobby. Uh, just this beautiful piece, all glass, individually placed. And uh, again, you know, we could have it without the model, and we shot it without the model, but um, it just adds a little uh, sense of scale. You see how high this is clearly, and it adds a little bit of interest too. And you know, she's fashionably dressed, she's beautiful. It, it you know, just adds a little something, something to the shot. Um, this was uh, um, the uh, Hyatt Royal Palms uh, in Scottsdale. Uh, <laughs> if anybody's seen the, the, the TV show, The Bachelor, uh, that's what this reminds me of. Um, when we got there, uh, I think the lights were out on this tree and this tree. And so uh, the, my retoucher had to basically take all of the lights from whatever trees that they were and then composite them in here one by one to kind of fill all of this in. Uh, they weren't able to get them going on set. So there we were, we, we had to fill them in. <clears throat> Otherwise those trees were black, uh, just black holes. Um, yeah, so this was a matter of, uh, of, of multiple exposures. I think we took, you know, uh, it's, it's typically five exposures, kind of one base, uh, at one a little brighter, one a lot brighter, one a little darker, one a lot darker, and then you're compositing all those elements in together. Um, the little, little water droplets, are, you know, long exposure, uh, you know, we might be several seconds here, uh, and so that piece gets composited in. You can tell by the, um, by the, the, uh, the star-like pattern coming off the specular highlight that were up way up at like F22. And the idea there was to get all the sparkle out of all of these individual lights as much as we could. So to do that, you know, again, we're up like F16, F22, as high as we can get that aperture, long, long exposure. Um, so here, um, this has all been lit up. Uh, so this doorway was one composite. So that's just one image right there. Here's a separate image, um, the mountain. Uh, I, that was put in separately. Um, so all, all these little pieces uh, to kind of get composited together to make one final. Um, a, a, an image that I, I won't get into them too much, but some, some challenges certainly with this one, uh, client requests versus what, <laughs> what you want to do. Um, so here's an example of a, of a shot that is taken on an exceptionally wide lens, uh, I would argue too wide of a lens, um, but uh, this shot is, they want to show all the space in one photograph. That's great. The problem is when you get to the edges of the photograph like this, you see, I mean, that chair is, it looks like it's three feet long. Like it, it, it really distorts that, especially at the edges of a frame. There's not much of a way to really correct that too easily later. And so, um, you know, we shoot it as is and, and hope that the eye is drawn more into kind of this area of the image. Um, it, the reason that's so distorted is because it's very close to the lens. Once you get over to this side, of course, you know, it's 15, 20 feet away. We don't have to worry about that kind of distortion anymore. Um, you know, I think this is a better photograph personally or something along those lines, right? Um, but uh, sometimes you have to capture the whole space in one image, um, especially with hotels, you know, they might get to upload five images to Expedia and that's it. And so you've got to, that real estate is very expensive. So you've got to show it all in one shot. Um, this, uh, these windows, there's actually a building that I think extended out to about here, just a big black building that was right here. So this was completely replaced all the windows. Um, you know, you can kind of see there was a light placed above this chair, above this chair, above the martinis, um, a, a light back here to kind of give a nice soft, even light on the coffee maker. Same with the pot. Um, all of these were different elements. You've got a light over top of this chair. Um, yeah, all, 
all lit individually composited together. Um, this image was, was uh, um, actually just one light up into the ceiling uh, and, and that strobe hitting the white ceiling provided just a really nice soft um, uh, sort of illumination over everything. Um, <clears throat> so this is just an example of, of, of an image that was captured in one. Of course, the view was replaced. Um, it, you know, good luck getting a nice sunny day in Vancouver. We were there for a week. We went around on the nice day, the one nice day, shot all the views, and then those get composited in later on. Um, and uh, um, one little note, this, this uh, if, if you know this building in Vancouver, this is a very, very bright red stripe. So we kind of did what we could to cheat it uh, and just desaturate that little stripe so it wasn't just stealing your attention from, from this room. Um, you know, this chair is very bright, bathtub's very bright, the color in these pull your eye. So you've kind of got all these little elements that are all sort of trying to take away your attention. And, and again, going back to that idea that you want a person to linger on a photograph for as long as you possibly can. You want them to stay in there and, and look around it and, and remain engaged. Uh, so it's what I try to keep in mind when we're shooting these things. Um, a resort casino, uh, just very quickly, um, this was a very, very heavy composite image. Um, again, you've got these starlight patterns coming off the lights, high aperture. <clears throat> We wanted lots of focal distance. We wanted this chair sharp and we wanted this back wall sharp. And so, you know, I think we were up around F16 for this shot to make sure everything's in focus. Um, and then assistant took a light and on that long exposure, I'm going to say this was probably upwards of five, 10 seconds. That assistant ran along here with a light over top of these chairs and illuminated all the tops of the chairs in one frame came over here, ran along here, did the same thing on this side. Um, they were wearing all black. And so on a long exposure, you don't see them. They're actually in this photograph, but you don't see them. Uh, all you see is what they have lit. Um, they have not lit themselves. They've lit the chair. They were wearing black. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's one, uh, one composite. Uh, and then we took a large softbox and, uh, and this was one shot. This was one shot, this was one shot, this was one shot. And the lighting assistant just moved from section to section, lighting each section separately. And you can kind of, sorry, this is a low res version, but you can kind of see, you get this really nice soft, um, I call it sort of puffy light that's landing on all of this stuff. And that's from that soft box being really close and really big. Uh, and it just gives that really soft, almost sort of fashion light light on that section. So. Um, uh, another little thing I like to do if I've got the time is um, if anybody has ever watched Lord of the Rings series, um, the, the pay attention to the lighting in Lord of the Rings. I, I try to incorporate it as much as I can into my work where you'll find that <clears throat> the background of an image and that, and that goes back to, uh, I'll bring up uh, this shot, sort of the peripherals of an image or the background of, of an image utilizes a lot of blue. And then the, the focus of the image utilizes warm colors. And I like that kind of sense that you're kind of coming in from the cold and you've got this warmth in, in your main focus and you're drawing the eye into the warmest part of the frame. And so we, we, it's a very, very subtle thing, but we put blue light, we gelled blue lights in the background back here. And again, it's just to kind of create that sense of, of warmth and hominess in this space. Um, and I think this is the last one. Uh, this is just a, a very simple kind of real estate architectural shot. We, this was the uh, um, McKinley Beach show home uh, in Kelowna. And uh, uh, this is just three very simple composites, um, uh, one base shot uh, for this, uh, one much brighter. I think we were two or three stops over. And that was to fill in this area. It was quite dark in the photo, so the staircase. Uh, and all we did was pen tool this whole section right here and drop that in. So that's a separate frame. And then one final frame was my assistant was standing right in the frame right here. And uh, they had a soft box over top of these chairs. And you can just see these little edge lights on top of the chairs just to provide some separation from the back uh, in here because it was black. You want those to stand out a little bit. They become a little bit of a focal point. So it's important that they're nicely lit. Uh, yeah, so just three very simple images all composited to make a final. One thing I haven't talked about that, but I should is, you know, 
you don't always have to get into compositing either. Uh, the dodge tool is an exceptionally powerful tool in Photoshop. So you could take a shot like this, let's say you captured it like this in Photoshop and just go in and actually I'll, I'll just throw it in here as an example. <clears throat> um, Oh, actually, there you go. So you can actually see uh, uh, my my lines. So if you kind of go here, you can drag in these lines and make sure that all of your points are straight. <clears throat> so I'm ensuring that all of these lines are straight up and down. I'm print bringing down these. I'm making sure they're straight that way. That's a very important thing, particularly to architects and designers, is that those are all those lines are straight. Um, so let's bring up that uh, dodge tool. Uh, we'll set our exposure level up to 100 and you know you can just go in here and you can kind of in a sense relight a scene you know we want these a little brighter you know let's make those pop a little bit more that kind of thing we want a little hit on the back wall like it's coming from that light we pop it in there let's say we uh you know maybe these uh, let's say our ceiling's too hot or, or maybe this edge is too hot we'll just kind of bring that down there we'll bring this in here that's a little overkill um that kind of thing you know, so here's a, a before and after. So that's just, that's just very simply using the dodge and burn tools, uh, which can be exceptionally powerful for highlighting certain areas of your frame if you don't want to get into compositing. And even though I do do a lot of compositing, this is still a very powerful tool and I use it a lot. So I was thinking, um, how are we doing on time here, 820? So I was thinking I would do an actual composite just to sort of highlight what I'm what I'm talking about here with compositing. I've already, as you can see here, I've already laid out uh, my, let's see, five different frames that I'm going to use to create the final image. And I'm going to do this really quickly. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on details, that sort of thing, just to give you a general sense of, of how this works. So I've got my base shot and I'll go through and I'll label all of my all of my different layers. Uh, we've got our model who's lit separately. I've got to lighting assistant who I wanted to get in really close so that we get that nice soft puffy light, you know, that fashion light on our model. If this light was, you know, back here out of frame, um, it, it just wouldn't have the same quality. You wouldn't get this nice soft shadow coming off of her. Um, you wouldn't get this nice soft light uh, on her face. It's a very fashion style of lighting. Um, <clears throat> so we get, you know, my assistant right in, She's lighting her up, that kind of thing. Um, okay, so there's there's our model. Then we've got a frame that's lighter. Uh, it's the sa same as the base, just a lighter version. Uh, then we've got a right accent. So we're picking up this little ottoman here, and then we've got a left accent. Um, I will I will um, sort of say that uh, in the in the final image of this, we actually ended up taking this light off of this ottoman and reversing it and placing it over top of this one because we actually liked this better than this. This one didn't work out as well as we thought. Anyway, just a minor little detail I'll mention. So going through this, we've got our base. Uh, we'll throw in our model. Now, as you can see, like the, the, the shots line up perfectly. The, tr the camera's on a tripod. We haven't touched it. It's, it's tethered to a laptop. Uh, if you don't want to tether to a laptop, you can also use you know that remote trigger that you've got plugged into your camera. Um, so it, either way, Camera's locked off, we've got it sandbagged, cones around it, whatever you have to do, nobody goes near it. You don't want that camera moving and we fire multiple frames of different things, whatever we wanna do. If we wanna put a, a, a vase of flowers here in one shot, go for it. Uh, if you decide not to keep it later, that's fine. Um, so we've got our model here. We'll throw on our um, <clears throat> layer mask. Black to conceal, white to reveal. So we come in here and just very roughly, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just kind of paint her in. So I'll drop her into the frame. Um, her table moves a little bit here. So I'm gonna put that, I think she might've kicked it. So we put that in there just like that. And I've got a little bit extra spill here. So I'm gonna <clears throat> uh, switch over to black, get rid of that. Um, I'm gonna switch to 50% opacity. I'm just gonna feather this in, no, feather this in a little bit more, that kind of thing. I might actually, uh, give her a little bit more of a feather here, just so it's a little bit more natural, kind of blends into the tonality of the base layer coach. Okay, so there we, th there's a very rough kind of tossing in the model. And if the client decides later on, ah, actually, you know what, we don't want the model, that's fine. You just click off the layer, right? Uh, so we've, we've got our model there. And then, um, you know, frames looking good, but I, f I feel like this is a little bit dark. So again, we could, we could go certainly to the dodge tool and we can go in here 
and uh, you know we can hit it you know this sort of thing but i find that um it 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 degrades the image in, in a certain way. You get weird color saturation images. Uh, you, there's only so far you can push that. So the best way is we throw in our lighter frame. Uh, we add our layer mask, black to, uh, black to conceal. We switch to our white and I'll just go in here. So with my opacity, I'll usually turn it to about 30%. <clears throat> so I just hit that three key and I'm kind of getting that to about there. And I'll just kind of go in here and just kind of paint it until about the point where I feel happy. And I'm thinking, yeah, somewhere in about there, that's looking pretty good. I'll come over to the other side, I'll paint that in, kind of somewhere in there, get some on the books here, that's looking pretty good. Might add a little bit of extra something, something to those right there, that's good. So then we go into our right accent and we add our layer mask there and I'll go in and I'll just paint that element. So we get a little bit of hit of light on that. That's good. And then we can see that the color temperature is quite a bit different from the scene. It doesn't make much sense that it's blue. So I'll go in here and I'll add a, um, uh, let's, let's just, just for, normally I'd do a color uh, curves, but uh, that gets a little bit tedious. So just for sake of uh, speed, we'll go into a photo filter and we'll just throw on a warming filter here, bring up our color temperature um, to about that point. That's good. You get the idea. So we've just warmed up that piece just like that. And then we do the same thing with the left accent. Uh, we'll uh, throw in our layer mask, put that in, and then we're going to reveal it with white, just like that. And then once we're on that layer, we can, again, this is the quick and simple way, just go up to our photo filter, uh, warm it up. And now we've got roughly, you know, uh, a color temperature that matches. Um, so that's sort of, you kind of, uh, I'll turn all these off. Let me just delete this guy. So there's kind of before and there's after. So that's just a, you know, I, I mean, that what was that? Six minutes, seven minutes, a, a very quick, rough and dirty composite. Um, but as you can see, just taking multiple frames different exposures, throwing in different elements, trying different things, playing around, can really take architectural photography to the next level. And all you need for this is a camera and a tripod. Um, it, it's, it's pretty simple, right? Um, so and now, of course, to, one thing I'll do before I finalize this image, let's just flatten all this together. Actually, I'll just in case, duplicate, merge those. So let's say this is kind of our, more or less our final. I'll throw on our grid and let's kind of line up some of these right here. So then I'll go into uh, skew, transform skew, and I'll just kind of start going around here and making sure that all of those lines are straight. So you can kind of see this distance is equal on this side. Um, <clears throat> coach, I've got to pull that down on this side a little bit just kind of getting all those lines nice and straight um, right here. So we pull this line over here. Um, I can tell that I've got to pull this over to the left, just tiny, tiny bit. This was pretty, pretty close. Um, it can get a lot worse than that, than this, that's for sure. But um, we had the time on set to kind of tweak things and we were connected to a laptop. So we, ha we had the opportunity on set to kind of get this as close to perfect as we could. Um, in the end, we didn't like the vents up here. And so the final shot, got cropped to about there. We didn't like all this negative space down here. It got cropped to about there. Um, and then with some retouching to the carpet, cleaning that up, uh, this was more or less around where we ended with our final shot. All of these distracting elements, they were all pulled out, all this sort of stuff. It was all removed later. Um, yeah, so that the eye is drawn just to sort of your subject matter. Clients love this because they can come back years later and say, you know what, that uh, model release, uh, it, it has expired. We can no longer use her in that image. So we just go in here and, uh, and we turn her off, you know, so it makes it, it makes it pretty easy. Regardless of whether or not you're doing this in your photography now, at least I think it, it can keep your mind open to the possibilities that you can do with any type of photography. Compositing, uh, especially in the last five years, has become a very big part of photography. Okay, so we can open up to questions, I guess.